wonderful day to gather and worship together as the body of Christ. To reflect this week, we take a look at what we've learned once again during this pandemic as it has been unfolding in our lives. We've all learned something about ourselves and our family during these cloistered and twisted and upside down days. Some days seem to run one into the next and others seem very unique and bright and stand upon themselves. We We may have witnessed many new sides to each member of our family. Some of them we have enjoyed, some not so much so. We've witnessed others become teachers and referees, short order cooks, laundresses, lawn guys, caretakers, IT whizzes, counselors, judges, companions of grace on many, many levels. We may have had to change and adjust our ways of doing things, giving leeway on some issues, we call that compromise. Giving up on other issues, we don't call it defeat, we just call it, it doesn't work that way anymore. Giving away control so that we can discover what is essential and what is non-essential. Giving God the glory for helping us through all of this. Why? We want to keep our family and our lives afloat. A pandemic, a health crisis is still in our midst, and we are glad that you are here to worship with us this day. Louisa May Elcott once said, I'm not afraid of the storms because I'm learning how to sail my ship. Boy, aren't we all? Just trying to keep everything afloat is a full-time task. Our opening song that you will hear this, this day calls us to be called by God. Our, our opening song. Let us turn to the Lord in a time of prayer as we gather together as the body of Christ. On this wonderful day, Lord, we gather together to seek your direction, to give thanks for your creation. Lord of light and love, for you to lead our congregation forward into healthy, faithful ways. 
We gather to give thanks for the leadership of our nation and community and this incredible church. We gather to lend our support and care for all that are entrusted to our care as God's children. Red, brown, yellow, black, white, all of humanity, all of one. We especially lift up in prayer and claim the prejudice we all may harbor now and again. The prejudice towards others, the prejudices we may have toward you. Lord, lead our lives to look beyond the color of skin and realize it is the character that counts, the kindness, the intelligence, the leadership, the love, the mercy, the beauty, the strength that all of your children and humanity bring to life. Finally, Lord, we pray for those in our world trying to continue and control and defeat the coronavirus sweeping over our nation and the world. And we pray that your will shall be done as we give thanks this day for the people in our lives, in our flock, and yes, in our lifeboat. Amen. Now, during the summer, since we're unable to have Vacation Bible School this year, we will be having Summer Kids Kits. They're available after worship for families with children. These kits will include a project directly related to what you're experiencing now in worship and the message. The theme will follow each Sunday. I think you'll enjoy the opportunity to build and do each one of these. And if you're unable to pick one up now, you can simply call the church office and one will be made available for you, and if need be, even delivered. So welcome aboard, buckaroos and sailors, boys and girls. I'm glad to have you here this day as we celebrate time together in the children's moment. Now, as you can see, Behind me, I have built a ship. Sam helped me too. This is the USS Agnes. Agnes in Latin means lamb or sheep. So I had my first mate from April 29th, I think, or 28th. The last time I brought him out, he has returned, and we have created the USS Agnes. And why is that? Because there's a story that's coming um, that I'm going to read from the scriptures in a little bit that has to do about Jesus and being with the fishermen and having to sail as well. You know, Jesus was a carpenter, and there's a good chance that since he lived in the region of Galilee and got to know all the fishermen, he probably, now and again, had to work on some of their boats to help them stay afloat. You know, sometimes in life, you have to take the boat out of the water and you have to put it on dry dock. And there you work on things that broke during the season or that failed. And I bet, I bet Jesus worked on a lot of boats that were in dry dock. Now remember kids, don't forget to get your summer kids kit for this first project, our discovery of Jesus on the high seas of Galilee. Hope you can get one and pick one up. We'll see you soon. So let us listen to the powerful words for tonight's story. They come from Matthew's Gospel and Mark's Gospel. One assigned, one selected. Matthew's is assigned and Mark's is selected. This Sunday, we have Jesus out on the boat with his disciples. And that experience with the fishermen shaped the fishermen's lives, I think. It's not an easy thing to do. Because in that storm situation, Jesus was at rest. 
as if he didn't even notice that there was a storm going on. Well, let me just share the story with you. First from Matthew, and then the storm from Mark. Matthew writes for us in chapter 10, beginning with verse 40, He who receives you receives me, and he who receives me receives the one who sent me. Anyone who receives a prophet, because he is a prophet, will receive a prophet's reward. And anyone who receives a righteous man, because he is a righteous man, will receive a righteous man's reward. And if any of you give even a cold drink of water to one of these little ones, because he is my disciple, I will tell you the truth. He will certainly not lose his reward. From Mark's Gospel, beginning in chapter 4 and starting with verse 35. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, Let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along, just as he was in the boat. There were all other boats with him, but a furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat, so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we're drowned? He got up rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. And then the wind died down and was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? Elliot this week actually reinforced the song that was just sung. It was something I had written in advance and was ready to share. And I open up the paper today and there it is. Lee is telling us to look at your hands. So just take a moment for a second. Take a look at your hands. Are they strong? 
Do you have those lean, nice fingers, long ones like piano players always want and guitar players? Or are you like me and you have these short little hands and they look like Jimmy Dean sausages? Are they calloused or smooth? Do you like them? Do you decorate them? Do your hands tell a story? Are they essential to what you do? Could you live without your hands? Do your hands tell a story? You know, this finger broke because, that one got the pin because, the cut here because, the surgery there because. Jesus' hands, carpenter's hands, I'm sure they told a story too. Try this history lesson on for size. Do you realize that in 1907, one of the largest ship hulls forged and created took place in Harlan Wolf Shipyard in Belfast, Ireland? Owned by the White Star Line, this ship was outfitted with the greatest design, most modern equipment for the day. However, just like the fictional Death Star from the Star Wars series, Little did the designer realize that even the unsinkable Molly Brown ship had a flaw or two in her Titanic story. Flaw number one, human engineering. Yes, the RMS Titanic was watertight, compartmentized, designed, contained a flaw that was a crucial factor in the Titanic sinking. While each individual bulkhead was watertight, all 14 of them. The walls separating each head, each extension, were only a few feet above the water line. So, water could pour from one compartment into the next if the ship began to list or plunge and pitch forward on the bow. So when the iceberg slashed a 300-foot gash in the side of that beautiful ship on its virgin voyage, beneath the waterline, in the bow section, near the front of the ship, sea water started pouring in, and like an ice cube tray, it started filling each one up. And with each one that filled, it kept going up in the back, in the bow, in the stern, excuse me, and down in the bow. Now, for civil engineering types, this was an interesting Achilles heel the ship possessed. Unthought of at the time and the moment, an engineering flaw. The second flaw was human arrogance, flaw number two. The second critical safety lapse that contributed to the loss of over 1,500 lives, there weren't enough lifeboats carried on the Titanic. They had 16 lifeboats, plus four Engelhart, not related to Dave, but Engelhart collapsible boats to accommodate 1,178 people. The Titanic carried 2,435 passengers, and I'm not done, and 900 crew members. A capacity of 3,300 people, and they had less than half enough room on the lifeboats to save everybody. As a result, if the lifeboats were fully loaded to capacity during the emergency evacuation, there were not going to be enough seats. Someone was going to be sacrificed. Someone was going to die. It was bound to happen because how long can you tread water in the icy Atlantic, North Atlantic Ocean? So the second flaw design was human arrogance. Arrogance. 
An attitude of arrogance that seemed to wash over the building of this exceptional luxury vessel. As if to say we put more in the non-essentials of this ship like decor, luxury, amenities, a big bar, lots of exotic food, and not enough in the essentials, like keeping all the passengers safe, secure, and sound. Human arrogance, what an attitude to have in 1912. And then it just, it kind of blew me out of the water as I was researching this. The reality was, is that the Titanic actually had more than what was on the books and the laws. They actually had more than they really needed. They felt they were going above and beyond. Technically, they were only supposed to have 10 lifeboats. They almost doubled it. It makes you imagine. It makes you think. It may even take your breath away. What are we learning about our lifeboat during this pandemic storm and this journey? During these pandemic days of multiplicity of changes and challenges around us, I've often heard this phrase, we're all in the same boat, we're all in this together. Part of that's right, part of it's completely wrong. Let's dissect it. Fact. Yes, all of the disciples and Jesus were in the same boat. The old fishing boat that they used to shuttle them to and fro across the Sea of Galilee, they traveled together, worked together, learned together, healed together, gave together. They were a team, a unit, a flock. But we cannot say that for those facing this pandemic storm, all the lifeboats were the same. Now remember, in the scriptures, they mentioned that there were a lot of boats, but then we focused just on the one, the one that Jesus was on. But there were more boats that were going across, following Jesus and the disciples. So work with me this day. All of the boats are different. We are all facing the same health storm, but we're not all in the same boat. I'm sorry to say that. Some of our lifeboats are better equipped than others. So what do I mean? Well, your lifeboat may be more fortified than your neighbor's lifeboat. And the neighbor on the other side of you, their lifeboat may be more fortified than your lifeboat. So the reverse could be true. So when Governor DeWine and Dr. Acton administered the shelter-in-place order last March, Many of us did as we were told. We, we hunkered down and found our place and purpose in our lifeboat. We'll take care of our own, take care of our crew, and do the best we can. We'll grab the oars, grab the rigging, pull hard, sail as best we can. Do things we never imagined that we would be asked to do. Just like the disciples who sailed their best with the Son of God, doing everything in their power to get through this storm. And they were failing till they went and woke Jesus up and said, You gotta do something about this, brother. But back to our Corona Sea experience. For some of us, shelter in place has been nothing more than an anomaly, a glitch in the pattern of your day. A trifle little thing. For some of us, going into shelter in place has ground away at our very roots. It has been difficult. And yet, we have mustered the courage to make the difference. To press on. To keep sailing. And for some of our neighbors, this storm remains a nightmare of hellish proportions. Loss of income, loss of job, loss of benefits, loss of focus, depression, struggle, alcoholism, drug abuse. Why? I'm not sure where to turn because it seems like I can't bail out fast enough my lifeboat. It's just flooding in like the scripture said. Jesus, wake up, will you? 
The water's coming over the gunwales. Will you wake up and help us? Not every lifeboat, not every family, not every crew is the same. For some of us, shelter in place has been optimal. A moment of reflection, yes, an inconvenience, but adjustments to new ways and patterns and even quarantine was a a personal study break, a renewal of the spirit. You know, grab your campy clothes, your PJs, binge on Netflix, have a couple of bottles of wine with the wine, pontificate about the world problems and how you would solve them all much better. But in this wave of history, playing Xbox while your neighbor is bailing out their boat doesn't seem to be quite appropriate. For other brothers and sisters, this pandemic storm has meant working harder, going on unemployment, struggling. Everyone's lifeboat is equipped differently, and the crew that is in that boat is just as different. Think of those in the nursing homes and hospitals. The pandemic sea brought about loneliness and isolation that weathered away at their personal armor and found our raw and vulnerable weaknesses in their journey. And we mourn and wait and linger and hope that soon we can go see those who've been sequestered and kept away. But see, some lifeboats and crews are better off than others. Some lifeboaters lost their jobs. Maybe you were one of them. They were let go or not hired back. Others were fortunate enough to have a job the whole time because their job was considered essential. And sometimes you wondered about the rationale behind that, but that's a whole different story. And then on the other hand, others in different lifeboats were working more hours for less money, taking pay cuts, working extra jobs and side jobs to make the ends meet. Some lifeboats and crews are better off than others. Some want to go back to work because they didn't qualify for unemployment and they're running out of money. Others want to confront those who treated quarantine and social distancing and mask wearing with a piece of their mind. And some lifeboaters have stored up enough fiscal supply in their acorn hut to weather the battering of the storm, even if we're in the midst of it still. Some lifeboats, their crew members needed to sit in their cars on the library grounds to use the Wi-Fi and complete their studies. And others, they just quit studying altogether. And still others in lifeboats that were different, they had plenty of giga power to finish their studies and purchase extra things from the smirk of Amazon. Some lifeboats and crews are better off than others. I wonder, how's your lifeboat faring? Some lifeboaters lost loved ones. Oh, but Pastor John, we haven't had to deal with that in the county. Yeah, we have. Over 350 people today, which would reach 350 families, have had to cope with this disease and sequester themselves for 12 days. And of 10 of those families, 10 watched a loved one pass away. So yes, we've had to deal with this. 122,000 lives have been lost across the United States. Oh, but Pastor John, I don't believe any of that. Well, even if you think those numbers are inflated, if you cut that in half, that's still more than all the soldiers that lost their lives in Vietnam still. 
realize. Mother Nature, like the coronavirus, does not care one iota about the amount of money you have in your checking account, the car that you drive, the truck that you own, the boat that you own, the education that you have, the family background that is yours, the house you live in, the kind of phone in your hip pocket, the shoes on your feet or the purse around your shoulder. The pandemic sea cares nothing for you. It has come to harm and disable us and test the true metal of our lifeboats. See, the virus is an equal opportunity attacker, treats us all the same, some people even more difficult than others. I mean, let me just go back to history just for a second in that titanic moment. On this virgin voyage of the Titanic, your chances of survival were 40% greater if you had purchased a first-class ticket. Like those lifeboats that left the Titanic, none of them were completely full. Not a one. In fact, the first one they launched that was supposed to hold 65 people to save their lives left with 28 because people panicked. And we've seen that as well. So what can we do? And where am I going? Let me go back to scripture in the Gospel of Luke and listen to what Luke said through Jesus. From Luke's hand, Jesus' description. From everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more, more will even be asked. If you have heard that line of wisdom, you know what it means to be accountable, to be responsible. If we have been blessed with talents and wealth and knowledge and time and understanding, we're expected to share that to grab the bucket and start bailing, or better yet, help them get their boat on shore, to dry dock it and repair it. That's one of our jobs as Christians, to repair our neighbors near and far. For there may come a time when they are the ones that repaired us and our ship as well. We help feed the hungry, clothe the naked, bring peace to the poor hearted, show others mercy, help them rebuild their moments. There are many more lifeboats in need of dry docking and repair. And as Christians, we can be the master of the harbor and help them to bring them in, fix them up. Why? Because we know this one fact that is so essential Jesus saves. Jesus doesn't condemn. Jesus saves. Jesus doesn't cast us out. Jesus saves. Jesus saves, and yet some of us who have heard this claim time and time again have never accepted that fact, that he is there to save your life, heart to heart. Maybe this late June day, is time to invite him into your heart and let him save you and the crew in your boat of life. So friends, we're all piloting different lifeboats with wonderful and unique crews, but make sure you don't just focus on your crew, but look around. And if you see a neighbor or a brother who's Bailing away, pull up aside if you can and help them out. Do what you can because they need your help. No one, even the great makers of the Titanic, thought it was possible. 
No one believed that she could actually fail and sink. The Titanic was a luxury British steamship that sank early hours of April 15th, 1912. And 1,500 people plus lost their lives. So let us never let our prideful swagger be the flaw that sinks us because we said, not my boat, not my crew, not my life. So wash your hands, wear your mask, social distance, stay connected with others, and always remember, Jesus will calm the most fearful storm in your life if you just pray to him and ask him. His will shall be done.
Go now in peace and serve the Lord with gladness, for each and every day our loving God is gladly and abundantly serving you. Yeah.